We are talking about calcium today. You know, you know it. It's in your milk and we drink it so that we have really hard, strong bones. But it's also the stuff that builds up on our dishes and in our tubs. Calcium, that stuff we want to get rid of. So how the heck does it connect to high blood pressure? Well, it turns out, just as it makes our bones really hard and, and solid, calcium also makes our muscles contract and makes them firm, which is something we don't want when we have high blood pressure. We're gonna talk about calcium channel blockers in this video right after this. Welcome back, my name is Tammy and this is Nurse Minder and on this channel we do everything nursing. So if you're new here, consider subscribing below so that you get the next video when it's released. Calcium channel blockers are another classification of medications that we use to treat high blood pressure, also known as hypertension. We know that high blood pressure is a silent killer. That means we don't have signs and symptoms when our blood pressure is elevating above normal. In a previous video, I'll put it here, we did talk about what is high blood pressure, what will the normal values be, and when should you be concerned about those numbers. Remember, you don't have signs or symptoms, and so you won't feel like there's a problem, but there are definite risks associated with high blood pressure. In another video, we talked about the step management that we have in dealing with high blood pressure. And the first step is always looking at those things we can control, such as our diet or environmental factors, whether that's smoking, alcohol, drug use, exercise, those pieces that we can chip away at slowly to make a difference. But when they're ineffective, we need to add medications. So in this video, we're gonna talk about what calcium does. First of all, we need to understand what calcium's role is so we understand why blocking it is so effective. Then we're gonna talk about a cal what a calcium channel blocker is. So we're gonna uncover the elements that nurses need to know. So how do I identify a calcium channel blocker? There are some clues in our drug naming. Who would be prescribed a calcium channel blocker? What are the considerations I need to have before I give this calcium channel blocker? What are some of the side effects in patient teaching? And then some of my follow-up considerations and things like that. So we're gonna go over all those pieces in this video. But let's start with, oh, and of course, stick to the end because we're gonna have an NCLEX review. And in these videos, I give you a question, give you some time to think about it, and then we go through the rationale as to why the question has a correct answer and incorrect answer. So be sure to stay till the end for that. What is the role of calcium in the body? As we talked right up at the beginning, it's about making our bones strong. We need them for muscle contraction. That's right, baby. We also need them for our teeth. And there's a lot of things that our body needs calcium for. And when it comes to where calcium works inside our cardiovascular system and how that impacts our blood pressure, we need to look at three key things. The first is rate, the second is force, and the third is resistance. So calcium is needed to control the rate of the heart. The SA node and the AV node, these generate their own electrical impulses. I talk about this in our ECG training. I can put the description below if you're interested in more. But calcium really is like the igniter, the one that causes that muscular contraction. That muscular contraction is responsible for the force. When the heart contracts, how hard does it need to work in order to expel the blood out of the ventricles to the heart, to the body, sorry. Now, when it is contracting to move that forward out of the ventricles to the body, there is a third factor and that's resistance. You can imagine that if we have a small tube, we have to push really hard to get our fluid through it. Whereas if we have a really wide tube, it's really little effort. It's almost like walking through a door. If you consider this first tube, this really small, narrow vessel, to be like a doorway that's barely open and you're trying to wiggle your way through it, you have to exert a lot of pressure to get through. But if the door is wide open and you can just walk through easily, it doesn't require you to put forward a lot of effort to get through the door. The same is true here. The same is true here. So calcium is required for the rate. We need it for the SA node to function inside your heart. 
We also need it to create a contraction inside the muscles of the heart. And thirdly, these would be the peripheral vessels. So as the blood leaves the heart, how narrow, how wide those vessels are to deliver the arteries in particular, to deliver the blood to the body is a, is a factor of calcium. Now let's look at those who would be prescribed a calcium channel blocker. Obviously, because we're talking about high blood pressure in this video, yes, it is a treatment for high blood pressure. It is also used for angina and for vasospasm. So this would be like exercise induced chest pain where those vessels are maybe slightly occluded and not quite getting enough oxygen. We have a little bit of discomfort relieved with the medication because it causes dilation. And you may also have a patient on a calcium channel blocker who has a cardiac arrhythmia, such as atrial fibrillation, because it will slow the conduction down between the SA node to AV node and help to regulate that contraction. Now, another group of patients who may have a calcium channel blocker are those who have a diagnosis of heart failure. But there are some special precautions that we need to know about because people in heart failure are dependent upon preload. So we're going to look at the different categories now of calcium channel blockers and really dive into they have specific sites that they're more likely to have an impact on such as rate, force, and resistance. So let's get started with looking at the categories. Now there are two groups of calcium channel blockers and then within one of those we have two subgroups. This is usually where students tune out snoozeville just stick with me for this little complicated piece because you're generally not going to see this on an NCLEX but it helps to just put things into their categories right they should be put into the blocks that they belong dihydropyridines is the first group and then the other group is non dihydropyridines okay so we've got the dihydropyridines and those are commonly the ones that end in peen p-i-n-e in fact, many of them actually have dipine on the end, D-I-P-I-N-E. You'll see that a lot. So amlodipine, nifedipine, philodipine, those are examples of the dihydropyridines. They are primarily focused on vascular vasodilation. So they're really looking at creating more space within the vessels for the blood to pool, not to pool, for the blood to reside, which means it's going to take longer to get to the heart. We're going to have a little bit less fluid entering into the chamber. So my preload, the amount of fluid coming into the heart is less. The amount going into the ventricles is less. And then when it's pushing out of the heart, you know, just like as if you were to walk through a door, for example, it, when the door is wide open, it's really easy to walk through the door. And that's what's happening with dihydropyridines is that they are widening the gap in which the blood is going to go through so the pressure in the afterload the resistance is decreased this overall makes it easier for the heart to do its job as you can imagine walking through a wide open door when the vessels are vasoconstricted or that door just has that little tiny opening and you try to squeeze yourself through it all that extra effort you have to put into getting through that door that's just barely open is the same as the heart trying to push blood through a vessel that's really small. It's resisting, it's pushing back, and so the heart has to push harder. So dihydropyridines are focusing on decreasing the pressure that is needed to push forward that blood. The second grouping is the non-dihydropyridines, and within there, there's two different classifications. Really what this is just talking about when we get breaking it all down into its chemical structure is that they are chemically different, but they have similarities in how they work to decrease blood pressure. And so they become classified as calcium channel blockers, but they don't all look the same chemically. That's why they have different groups. Within the non dihydropyridines is where we're going to find verapamil. It's a phenylalkylamine, which is an example of a non dihydropyridine. Don't, don't tap out here, I know. It's a lot of words that we don't have a context around. They're not as important as what happens clinically when we are on a calcium channel blocker. And in particular, these three different classifications or these three different types have some particular things we need to watch out for. 
The other group of non-dihydropyridines non are the benzothiazepines. And the example of that is diltiazem. So now that we've got just that scientific piece taken care of, let's compare the dihydropyridines to the non-dihydropyridines in terms of how they affect the vessels and the heart rate. All right, so now it's time to look at where these specific drugs have an affinity towards. So they're really drawn to really work in a particular area. Now, amylodipines, if we use P-I-N-E-S as some clues, we can look at this as the P prevents pressure in the extremities. And so we're looking at that peripheral resistance. And so is it going to affect rate? No. Is it going to affect how strong my muscles contract? No. It's going to prevent, prevent pressure in the extremities. That's my clue in the pine. P is for prevent pressure in extremities. So it's going to be working on vessel size. So this is the affinity of all of those drugs that end in peen. Amlodipine, nifedipine are looking to reduce the pressure in those vessels, which means they're going to vasodilate. Now, when it comes to our non dihydropyridines, so that's our verapamil and diltiazem, these are more likely to affect a change in heart rate and muscle contraction. So, heart rate and muscle contraction. And one of the ways you can remember this is that both of these have the letter M in it M for muscle, M for mighty. And so we're going to be changing the rate down, we're gonna slow it down, and we're going to relax the muscles to decrease our blood pressure. Now remember, when someone's in heart failure, they are dependent upon the fluid coming back to the heart. They've already got a weak heart. It's not functioning properly, and it's already decreasing the amount of blood it can pump out. So we would not want to see a patient on a dihydropyridine such as amlodipine because remember peens will prevent the pressure in the extremities and they're going to drop even further and have even less blood coming back to the heart and that could be disastrous okay so now we're ready to give this medication these medications for the most part are oral tablets or capsules now here's a critical thing. If you have a long acting or an extended release, I should say an extended release tablet, do not cut it in half without talking with your pharmacy first. When we have a sustained release pill, as soon as we cut it in half, we've actually broken the integrity of the pill and now we'll get a quicker release and we can have toxic buildup of medication. So be careful which pills you are separating into two. Of course, before we give them, we need to do an assessment. We're going to assess our patient's cardiovascular system, which includes vital signs. We want to do an ECG to find out what their baseline is. You'll want to listen to the lungs because if these medications are slowing the heart rate and increasing the amount of blood that the vessels can hold, there is a risk for some edema in the lungs. So we definitely want to be listening to the lungs as well. And of course your lab work should include liver and kidney profiles because the drug is metabolized by the liver and excreted in the kidneys. If your patient has a history of liver or kidney disease, that would be a consideration in dosing as well. One of the biggest things you need to remember before you give this medication is that you need to check for heart rate and blood pressure. This is usually tested in your NCLEX as well. There's another NCLEX tip for you based on your patient's findings. So you definitely want to be watching for a systolic blood pressure of greater than 90 and a heart rate of greater than 60 before you consider giving this medication. If it's lower than either of those values, you'll want to hold it and reassess with the doctor. Part of the patient teaching is that because this is given, calcium channel blockers are given to decrease blood pressure, is that they may need to change position slowly if they start to notice they're a little bit faint or woozy when they get up really quickly. Here's a really important consideration that your patients need to know. If they're taking a calcium channel blocker, they should not be taking grapefruit juice at the same time. In fact, they should be spacing it out by like four hours. So 
it might just be even better just to avoid it altogether to me. And the reason grapefruit juice is a no-no is because when grapefruit juice is present in the system, the concentration of calcium channel blockers increases. So now that we know how the drugs work, predicting what side effects we could expect or anticipate becomes easier. Now that I know that my dihydropyridines are focused primarily on peripheral vascular resistance, opening up those vessels, I might think that we've got swelling and edema happening. Now that I have less blood flow coming to the heart, I might have some problems with the patient feeling a little bit uncomfortable, dizzy, faint because they're not having as much perfusion and that impacts the amount of output from the left side of your heart. With anything we take into our mouth, we always have nausea to consider. We can end up with a reflexive tachycardia, meaning that the heart is not getting as much fluid as it normally likes. We've decreased that. And then the heart's that whole renin-angiotensin-aldosterone pathway, pathway, the baroreceptors are all triggering for the heart to work harder. And so you may end up having a tachycardia, so you'll wanna watch for that as well. Now, in addition, for those patients who are on the non-dihydropyridines, we know that they have an affinity towards the SA node and the muscle contraction itself. So in particular, they often are used to treat arrhythmias. However, they can also cause arrhythmias. So we definitely wanna be following up on our patient's EKG to make sure we're not getting into a heart block of some sort as a result of that calcium being prevented from entering into those cells. So now it's time for an NCLEX review. The nurse is discharging a patient home on a new sustained release calcium channel blocker. What is a priority teaching point about this medication? A. Be sure to take your blood pressure two hours after you have taken your medication. B. Swallow the pill whole and do not crush, cut, or chew it. C. Take the drug with grapefruit juice to prevent stomach upset. D. Headaches can be a side effect of this medication. Go ahead and make your selection. All right, now let's take a look at these answers. If you selected A, take your blood pressure two hours after your medication, that'd be incorrect. And the reason is we need to assess blood pressure and heart rate before giving these medications. If you said B, swallow the pill whole, do not cut, crush, or chew it, that would be the correct answer because we know this is a sustained release drug and when we cut it, we have changed the integrity of the pill and they are at risk of drug toxicity. If you selected C, take the drug with grapefruit juice to help prevent stomach upset, well we actually want to avoid grapefruit juice because grapefruit juice will increase the concentration of calcium channel blockers, not what we want. And if you selected D, headaches are, or headaches can be a side effect of this medication, you would be correct. Yes, it is a side effect of these medications, but is that the priority? The priority is airway, breathing, circulation, pain, ABCs, pain. And so in this case, if we crush the pill, cut it in half, we have toxicity, and then we're at risk of an airway, breathing, circulation problem. Thanks for watching. I hope you learned a ton because it was an awful lot of fun bringing this video to you. Make sure you subscribe below so you're in line for the next video when it's released. Hit that like button and write me a comment. Let me know what you think of this video. If you have some ideas, I'd like to hear them as well. Until next time, make it a great day. Hey, I know you're probably not ready to get off your phone or go back to work just yet or maybe even turn the lights off to go to sleep. So why don't you spend a little bit more time here watching another video.